Welcome to Behind the White Coat Podcast. I am your host, Eric Malara, a first-year medical student. In this podcast, we listen to the stories of those underrepresented in medicine or those with an exceptionally non-traditional background. Today's guest is Frank Coppola, a first-year medical student with the class of 2023 at the Frank H. Netter MD School of Medicine at Quinnipiac, or simply known as Netter. Frank received his bachelor's degree in biology at Queens College, where he received the Donald E. Lansfield Award, which is awarded for the highest GPA of all graduating biology majors. Prior to this, he had been working in construction and painting for the past 20 years. It is my great privilege to be able to listen to and learn from Frank's story today. So welcome, Frank, and thank you for joining me today. All right. Thanks for having me, buddy. So can you talk to me a little bit about what you did prior to medical school and even college? Uh, yeah, so basically, um, you know, pretty much what you said in my 20s, I started working in construction. Um, I was also way into music at that point. So I was um, started a band, started writing music, uh, started getting way into that. Um, at some point, I decided I was going to go to audio engineering a technical school, which was like a one or two year school. And I did that. I was going to try to get into the, um, the, uh, audio engineering business at that point. I was in my late twenties around that time. And I was still working in construction to actually, you know, pay my way through school. Um, things weren't working out with that situation. It was tough to get jobs. And, uh, so at that point I, I figured, you know what, I want to go back to school. I had always wanted to go back and get a bachelor's and, I was very interested in biology, so I just kind of went back and I declared my bio major. And then I was like, okay, now what do I want to do with this? <laughs> like I, I kind of had, I came to like a crossroad. Like I, if I wanted to get into healthcare, I had to start making some preliminary decisions. So I started volunteering in a hospital. I went to the um, the uh, academic advising, the pre med, pre health advising at Queens college. And they said, you know, go start volunteering, see, see how you like it. And I just, I loved it. Like, I just liked the fast pace of the hospital. I, I just liked the atmosphere. I was already kind of leaning towards medicine in some way. And then once I started doing that, that was pretty much it. I, I was kind of, uh, kind of made my decision there. And, uh, that was basically it. So I finished up my bachelor's. I applied to a bunch of schools and, uh, I chose Netter and that's pretty much it. So can you talk to me about the process of getting interested in medicine? Like, how did that begin? It's strange. Like, you know, I'm not one of those people who like watch doctor shows when, when they were a kid or always wanted to be a doctor. It was really more of a, of a sequential process. Like I said, I was into biology and then I wasn't sure, like I kind of knew I didn't want to, I wasn't so much interested in like lower animals or plants or anything like that. It was really like human anatomy. And I think that was probably one of the things too, was when I started taking um, A&P courses, that got me really interested in, in human anatomy. And then pretty much around that time is when I started volunteering in hospitals and that kind of solidified it. So I guess it would be those two things right there that kind of, that kind of sold it. So for you, it was more like you said, sequential. Like first, you just wanted to go back and get your bachelor's. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I know a lot of people have that story. Like they wanted to be a doctor since they were five. And just, that just was not my thing. Like I'm not into doctor shows and you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. it just it, that wasn't what it was for me. And so can you maybe elaborate more on going back to school because you were working at the time too, right? You're going to school and you're working. I was. Yeah. So I guess I would have been early thirties. I said, you know what, I'm going to do it. I just kind of looked at it from a scheduling standpoint, like my work schedule. I said, you know what? I think I can do this. I was taking mainly night courses and Saturday courses. Uh, you know, it was tough, but I was working full time. I was taking mostly 12 credits. You know, it was tough. Like I just put my head down. I said, you know, I, I can get through this. And I kind of just figured it out. Like I scheduled it and it kind of just worked itself out. Like I kept pushing and Obviously, there were there were very difficult times, and there were some some uh, you know 
harder times than than others. But that was basically it. Like once I, I think once I figured out that I could schedule it and I could see it, I was like, okay, I can make it happen. And did your coworkers know about like your plans about going back to college or that you were going back? Um, they they did know. They knew I was in school. Um, they were kind of with me for the ride in the sense that they weren't like as I was going through it, I still wasn't sure what I was going to do. And they were kind of like, okay, you know, just going through it with me. Like as I would find out what I wanted to do, they would, you know, kind of just grow with me in that sense. But they were all kind of older guys. And so, you know, they weren't around my age. They were, you know, in their fifties at that point. So they were kind of looking me and, you know, like helping me out with suggestions about how to get things done and that kind of thing. So for the most part, they were all really supportive of your, your decision going back to college. Oh yeah, for sure. In fact, my old employee, my, uh, my old boss, my, my former employer, um, you know, he still texts me every once in a while. I was like, how's it going? How's med school going? And so he checks in. Totally. And from, from your personal experience with those, um, people in construction who maybe didn't choose that and it's not the best thing for them. Did you ever get a sense of maybe, or did they express that they wanted to do something different? It doesn't have to be medicine or even higher education, but did you ever get a sense of feeling that maybe they wanted to do something else? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you see that a lot. Like, uh, there was a guy that I worked with and he wanted to be in music. Um, and you know, you can tell when somebody's involved in something that they don't want to be they're they're kind of a little bit miserable about it. And you do see a good amount of that. Um, only because to some extent from, from higher powers involved in construction, there is a lot of, um, people being taken advantage of in the sense that, like I said, you have a lot of people who don't really want to be where they are. They kind of fell into it. And then you have, you know, the foreman or the upper, uh, the upper people that are, are controlling the situation who understand that. So, and they, but they also understand that they might not have any money, many other options. And so you do have a lot of that um, uh, aspect of where people are being taken advantage of because they know they don't really have too many other places to go. And so that's kind of something that I really didn't like to see about construction. And yeah, there's a lot of people who, who definitely, like I said, they kind of fell into it and they, they either wish they could have went back to school or like I said, there was one guy who wanted to be a singer, wanted to get into music, but you know, of course you have to be you know, incredibly talented and, and incredibly lucky. Um, so there is a lot of that for sure, especially with, with the people who really didn't foresee themselves getting into construction. They kind of just fell into it. And now they're like, well, I wish I could get out in some way. Um, but they kind of feel stuck. But I think in construction, what you have a lot of the time is people who didn't really choose it. They kind of just fell into it. And so, and for like me, I got into it by choice, but only because I kind of said, well, this is something that I can do while I'm trying to do something else, if that makes sense. Um, But there's a lot of people who get into it who kind of don't have a lot of other options. And for those for those, there's a lot of those people when I think with academia, you don't have a lot of that. For the most part, you have people who have chosen a path academically and say, okay, I want to do this. I want to do that. Or even if they kind of tried to do something and then they, they had to redirect, they still kind of chose that for the most part, or they kind of are okay with it. Like they're still, you know, they're going to be in academia in some, some way, shape or form. For construction, there's there's a large population of of uh, those people who just kind of fell into it and they're kind of stuck into it. And depending on this trade that they're in, it may be not the best situation that they could be in. Like, what was that first step for you? Like, you know, you want to go back to school. Like, what was that very first step? And what's something that maybe people in who were in your situation could do? If they want to go on and do something else, but they just they feel stuck, they feel trapped. So the first step I think is knowing that you want to go back and that you're, you're willing to, if you're going to work while you go to school, you're going to, you're going to be working hard. Like, so I think the first step is saying to yourself, I'm okay with that. Like, if you're like, Oh, I don't know. That sounds like a lot of work. I mean, if you can sit down and say, okay, I'm going to go to work from whatever in the morning to four in the afternoon, and then I'm going to go to school and then I'm going to study. You have to kind of calculate 
I'm going to be doing this for a large chunk of my time and there's going to be a lot of sacrifices. That's the first step to realizing it's going to be an enormous amount of work, depending on how long you're going to go to school for. Um, so, but from a logistic standpoint, I think the first step is finding a situation that works that a school that's close, a, um, a school that has programs that you want to get involved in. And then I think the biggest, the biggest aspect for me was basically the, how can I actually logistically get it done, which is scheduling. And so it's kind of like, okay, I want to do, I want to get this kind of degree. What are the courses I need? You get a list of the courses, then you say, okay, if I'm going to continue to work and go to school, this is the times I can work. These are the classes they offer. Can I make it happen? What are some benefits or like life lessons you learned from your construction that you found really useful in an academic setting, whether it's college or even medical school? So in construction, there's, there is a decent amount of teamwork, but there's also a lot of individual work and you are um, expected to take care of yourself and take care of your own work. Um, and so in academia, there is a lot of group work, but you have to understand that if you want to get something done, you're going to have to do it yourself. You're going to have to take responsibility. I've learned an enormous amount of responsibility from that standpoint of handling my, what I have to do, my responsibility. And if you're part of a team, you better make sure that you have your responsibility done because on a construction site, people will call you out and, you know, it is different than an academia setting, like depending on, and this is true, depending on who's, who's on the job and the type of personalities you're dealing with, it could come to like a physical situation. So, and I've seen that happen where somebody thought somebody wasn't pulling their weight um, or even worse, getting fired, to be perfectly honest. Like, I mean, a fight is a fight. Getting fired and, and not being able to, to make money is worse. So, and I think that's a, there's an aspect of that too, like in construction or, I mean, basically any kind of job, you don't pull your own weight, you know, enough times, maybe once or twice to get away with it. You don't pull your weight enough times, that's it. Um, so, I, I mean, that was a very big thing for me to learn. Uh, you really, you got to look out for what you have to do. Like you have to look out for your responsibilities and make sure you get them done. Um, there's also an aspect aspect of construction where the, I don't know, 75% of the times the, the, the way something is supposed to work out, a plan that you have doesn't. And that happens a lot in construction because depending on your employer or the construction site, you don't have this material. You don't have that material. It's on its way. They didn't order it. You know what I mean? So you'll go to complete a task. You're like, Oh, okay. We don't have uh we don't have this. We don't have that today. How are we going to make this work? There's a lot of figuring things out. It's like this kind of unspoken phrase, like, like get it done, figure it out. So I can't tell you how many times I've gone on a site and I went to go do something and I said, okay, I don't have half the tools I need to do this. And I just had to be like, okay. And I would, and I literally, and I kind of like prided myself at some point because it was like, I feel like I could have figured out pretty much anything, like give me half the tools I need. and it almost became like a game, like a creative game. Like I'll figure a way to get this done. And there's something really valuable in that. Like when you don't have a perfect situation, you really just have to figure out how to get something done. Um, that's probably the biggest thing. I've what heard. about your time at Queens college? So what was the biggest thing you might have learned in this academic setting? I think the biggest point is you don't need to have a big name education at a big name school to get a lot out of it. I mean, it was on one of the very lowest ends of tuition and I literally worked it to get into med school. And so, and, and a lot of people do it. And I, I guess the biggest thing that I saw there was those teachers are there to teach you, the professors are there to help you. Everybody's there to help you. But again, it's on you. The harder you work, the, the more you're going to get out of it. And you could just see the people who were, you know, maybe they weren't at Stony Brook or a big state school or, or you know, a big private school, but they didn't care. Like it was just kind of 
you can get out of this what you want to get out of it. So I think the biggest thing that I learned is you do not need a big name school to achieve something. It's kind of more about you. The, the opportunities are there and the education is there and the professors are there to help you, but they're not, they're not going to hold your hand. They're not going to baby you. And if you want it, you can get it. You, you make it work. So, you know, I, I, I say the same thing. Like I, well, for whatever tuition I spent there compared to Stony Brook and, you know, people end up in the same position, not to put down state schools or anything like that, but it's kind of like you can take a smaller school and, uh, and really make something out of it. And it's, and it's pretty much more on you. So you decided you want to pursue medicine, right? Um, what was that process like for you? It was pretty rigorous. I was volunteering at the time and it was a lot of um, meetings with my health advisor and she, she was excellent because she had a very um, laid out plan. Her plan was laid out for every student for the most part, pretty much like she takes in what your abilities are like the, as far as scheduling and what you're able to do. And she tells you what you need to do to make yourself a better candidate and a better applicant. And she kind of just lays it out and she gave very strict deadlines. And I, for getting information back to her because she was the one dealing with the, the med schools. And I knew a couple of people who, who missed her deadline and they would go to her and beg her um, to help them. And she would say, no, I gave you a deadline. And she was strict about it, but I think it was good. And so basically it was me going to her and her telling me, okay, go and volunteer. I would say, okay, I can volunteer, but that's pretty much the extent of what I could do from time to standpoint. And then she said, okay, then you need to do this uh, to get yourself to be a better applicant. Um, uh, and then at some point, there was a lot of me having to write autobiographies for her and doing a lot of that kind of legwork. I had to write a research paper, but there was a lot of that basically dealing with the, the, um, this pre-health office. Uh, but she made it very easy in the sense that once I got everything together with her, she created my package. Um, she sent it out to med schools. I did my own research about med schools. You know, she helped me obviously, of course, but, uh, I did my own research. Um, and it was basically kind of just that sequential maneuver of, okay, now you have to do this. Now you have to do that. Uh, then preparing for MCAT. Um, and then basically that was it. So you mentioned she made you like write autobiographies. Um, and so for one process of the application, if people don't know for med school is you write a personal statement, which is kind of like an autobiography. You put something on paper that's not including like your grades and your scores. So what was like that one thing you wanted the med schools to get across about you? That's a good question. I'm trying to think back now. Um, what I would have put, um, I think I wanted to have my, I guess, dedication just, um, for them to understand, you know, I was obviously an atypical applicant. I was early thirties or mid thirties at that point. Um, when I started the process, um, and I guess just for them to understand that how dedicated I was to it and you know, the things that I kind of had to go through. And I don't mean that in like a, what was me kind of thing, but more like, you know, I had to do these specific things and make these specific sacrifices and put this amount of work in. And I wanted them to just understand that was the level of dedication that, that I was putting in just for them to understand that how dedicated I was basically. Um, again, I couldn't write in there that I, I, wanted to do this since I was five years old and I couldn't write in there that I just had some kind of epiphany. Like I woke up one day and, Oh my gosh, I want to be a doctor. It just wasn't like that. So, you know, and, and so that wouldn't have worked. That wouldn't have, that wouldn't have fl uh, flown for me. But I think that's super valuable to know for other students, like not all medical students or physicians have thought that way, right? Like there's a lot of students that didn't figure out till later on. So I think it is important. Like you have this unique story of, yeah, you maybe didn't wake up when you were five and you, but you've had this journey. Um, 
So this is like part of the reason why I'm doing this podcast for students who maybe can't relate to anyone as a, like a medical student or a physician that it's, it's a huge range of people. Yeah. And I think all of our applicants are probably are in a similar boat unless, you know, I'm sure there may be some older applicants who had a dream when they were younger about being a doctor. And then for whatever reason, there was that, there was that point in time in between where they didn't do it and then did it later on. But I think a lot of them would probably more be in my boat. I think where they kind of just figured it out a little bit later. So what would you say to those students or, you know, maybe they're working a, they're in a different, pro- different profess- profession who maybe they think they're too old or people are telling them that they're too old to pursue medicine. Like, what would you tell them? That's another great question. Um, huh. Let's see. I mean, I think the best case scenario for somebody in that position is to do a lot of research first and see pretty much pretty much what it entails so i think a lot of this process too for me like i was able to look ahead but you can only look so far ahead and you can only make so many predictions and there was a lot of points on this road or I kind of had to say, I'm going to have to take a shot here, even though I don't know exactly what's going to happen. So there was, a, there was a lot of those points. But I think you can get a general idea by doing research and seeing what it's going to take, the length of time it's going to take. Um, and, then, and then also um, ask yourself why you want to do it. Uh, or... or I don't know. Sometimes that's not a great question. I think it's more of, um, do I really want to do it? Like for like, there's a like you can have a feeling of wanting to do something and not knowing exactly why, which I understand. But it's like, do you do you have that feeling? Does it give you that excitement? The thought of it, you know what I mean? Does it does it give you that whatever feeling that a lot of people can't describe? So do you have that feeling about it, or is it something where you're kind of like, oh, okay, this might be nice to do, like. You know, if, if you're having that kind of thought, then it's a long road and it's a hard one. So when you're applying and you submit your application, you know, I, I think it's safe for the most part. Most uh, pre-meds have like this, this doubt, this fear, like, oh, like, yeah, you submitted it, but am I going to get in? Um, was there ever a feeling for you, like the admissions committee on the other end, they received that application. And I know, right, every medical student has this statement, like we don't discriminate on age et cetera, et cetera. But in the back of your mind, was there ever a moment of like, yeah, but you know, they might look at it and be like, eh, um, I'm kind of doubting you because of your age. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, my process was hard in, in the sense, the application process, because, um, I wasn't getting anything. And I mean, I don't know what your application process was like. Um, but for whatever time frame that you have, where you're sitting there and you're getting dead air, it's kind of uh, soul crushing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, like I said, I, I don't know what your situation was, but I had that for a while. And so periodically, um, I would check in with, with Ms. Cook and I would say, and I would, I would have these conversations with her and I would basically say, look, I know, I would say, look, I know maybe you don't want to hurt my feelings or, you know, or maybe you can't say it, but I would say to her, listen, off the record, or just, just tell me straight up, is there any way that the age is affecting this? And she said, no, I don't believe that. So for every time that I started to think that age was a problem, she would, um, I would call her and she would say, no, I don't think so. Um, now was she, um, coaxing me a little bit to kind of relax me possibly. Um, I, I, what does my gut say? I think my gut says that for some of the schools, probably. Yeah, I would say so. I would say, although, you know, um, I didn't crush the MCATs. So let's, let's like, if you want to give a hypothetical, let's say I crush them. Right. Um, 
and then I wasn't getting any responses, I would have said, absolutely. It's the age problem, right? Like that would have made it more obvious if I was just crushing MCATs because I had a very high GPA. If I, had a, if I crushed the MCATs and had a super high GPA and all of a sudden I'm getting dead air from 10, 15 schools, okay, I mean, I get the picture. There's obviously something glaring. Um, but my MCATs weren't like crushed. So then there were, I had that like weird line of like, okay, it could be that maybe I didn't do as well as they wanted to see on the MCAT. Or maybe it's age. So like I couldn't really tell. I was in that limbo area. But um, I think my gut was telling me it may have been a combination for a couple of schools. I think a couple of schools might might have considered me if I had done a lot better on the MCAT. Right. And so I know there's like no way around it. Like med school is hard, right? And we're barely in our first year and it's only going to get harder. But like that's been said so many different times, so many different ways that med school is hard. But what has been the best thing about your first year or about med school so far? That's a great question. Hmm. Well, you're fantastic. <laughs> I, you know what? I'll tell you what. There are so many... Uh, I don't, like, I don't get to spend t- enough time, and it's tough, like my schedule is tough. Um, and it's med school. Everybody's schedule is, is, is tough, but, um, like I, I don't get to spend a lot of time hanging out with everybody, but like I have like, friends there like you and just, you know, a lot of people that I hang with or talk to. And it's just like, I feel like I'm part of this awesome club. <laughs> this is, I don't know how to describe it. But, um, and we all kind of have the same way of thinking or this, this, there's a certain thing I don't like get like um, philosophical or something. There's all, there's a, there's something in all of our brains and all of our psyche that has brought kind of brought us to this. And it's like super cool to have that connection with somebody. Does that make sense? Like we may all be different and we're different ages and we're all into different things from all different corners of the United States and the world too. But we all kind of have this, this one thing that like made us do this. You know what I mean? Like made us want to do it. Like there may be like a little bit of twinge of craziness in there. Like, I don't know how many people would put themselves through it, but there's just something about that. That's super cool. Like we're all kind of, we all have this one thing that kind of binds us no matter how different we are. And, um, like you can feel it, like even people that I don't know that well, or, or hang out with, like, I can just feel it between us. So, I mean, now I think that uh, that's probably the coolest thing. Well, awesome. Uh, I think we'll end it on that. Uh, any final thoughts? If I'm going to say anything to older applicants, it's you having to, to, you might have your own prejudices about yourself. And I, I can tell you that I am not prejudiced or from an age standpoint, like there are things that I, you know, say to myself, like, or have said in the past, like, okay, so I am a certain age. Can I do this? You know what I mean? Like you, you have to get past those. And when I did, when I did first start, I said, okay, like I went through undergrad and I handled it well and I did well. And I, and I, and I had a good GPA and, and I didn't really ever struggle. But there, you know, when I first started med school, I said, okay, I am this age. Um, can I handle it? You know what I mean? Like you, you do kind of question yourself too for, from an age standpoint. So there may be some of that, but I think that's okay. Like, I think that's, that's fine to do. Um, yeah. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Behind the White Coat. Please make sure you subscribe either on iTunes or Spotify so you can get notified when the next episode is released. Thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoyed this episode.